I had an aunt working down in a park in Petoskey, Michigan, Pennsylvania Park. She did all kinds of beadwork. Her name was Mary DeGovra. She asked me one day if I did quill work, and I thought she said quilt. And I said, yeah, I make quilts. And she says, I mean quill, and she spelled it out, Q-U-I-L-L. And I said, no, I never heard of it. She said, well, you should try it. She said, you'd be good at it. That's basket maker, porcupine quill worker, and 2014 National Heritage Fellow, Yvonne Walker Kishik. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast produced by the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Clearly, Yvonne Walker Kishik's Aunt Mary had an eye for hidden talent. Her niece creates birch bark masterpieces decorated with porcupine quills that realistically depict natural images and cultural symbols of the Odawa tribe. Although Yvonne is descended from a long line of Odawa and Ojibwe quill workers, she never saw the art form until she was 20 years old. But Yvonne quickly mastered traditional designs and then moved on to create even more complex and realistic patterns and shapes of flora and wildlife. Perhaps because she came so late herself to quill work, Yvonne is passionate about teaching and passing the tradition to the next generations. She's also learned the stories and traditions associated with quill work and include these in her classes when teaching the art form. I spoke with Yvonne the day she received her National Heritage Fellowship Award. We talked in the Lisner Auditorium, and you can occasionally hear another 2014 fellow in the background, Cowboy Manuel Donnelly, rehearsing for the Heritage Concert. I asked Yvonne how long she waited before following her Aunt Mary's advice to learn quill work. Not long after that, a few years later, Johnson and Kennedy's War and Poverty Program came along, and one day they came, knocked on my door, and said, have we got a job for you? So they placed me into a job working at an Ottawa and Chippewa Arts and Crafts Co-op, where I would answer the phone and do general office work. And there were workers there. There was basket maker, two quilt workers, a wood carver, and a jack of all trades. And learning to work with them throughout the winter, got to know them better. And then uh, I became used to working with them and taking care of customers that came in. Really perspired <laughs> heavily through my first customer. And when I made it, and, and they said, see, it's not so bad. Now, how did you begin to do quill work? I was in that store, and one of the women working there was Susan Shaganabe, and she was a quill worker. She was there also teaching her nephew, Duane Kyogama, and I came out and I would watch them. So one day I said, you know, I think I would like to try that. She said, good. She said, I'll teach you. And that's all she said. And then one day she come in and she says, today I'm going to teach you quill work. I said, oh, good. I went to the table where they were all working and sat down, and she says, no, no, no. She said, you're going to learn like I did. You're going to learn from scratch. So she took me out in the back, opened up her trunk. There was a great big dead porcupine in there. It was so bad that they, they scooped it up on the shovel and put it in the trunk. Shovel and all. Roadkill? Yeah, it was a roadkill. And so she put it on the ground for me, and, and she said, pull all the quills off. And she showed me how to get started. And what would, would you use? We it? did it by hand. Oh, really? Yeah, pull them out by hand. And then and, and she said, pull them all out and put them in a dishpan. So I pulled and pulled and pulled. And then I went in. I said, I think I'm done. She come out and she looked at it. And she would say, no, nope, some more. And then that happened a few more times. So finally I went in and I says, I think I'm done. And she comes out and she looks at it. And she says, good. She got a stick and started scraping in the driveway there. And we buried that porky right next to the shovel. Just dumped it in the hole and covered it up right in the driveway. <laughs> we weren't going to move it or carry it or do anything. I learned that day what upwind and downwind is. <laughs> I bet you did. <laughs> Can you briefly explain what quill work is? What are the materials that you use? I mean, porcupine quills, obviously, but what else? To make a quill box, we use porcupine quills, which is the hair of the porcupine, all different lengths, half inch to maybe four inches long, and different diameters, too. And they come in different colors. So they could, they could be white or white and brown or white with yellow tips or very, very dark, or all brown. So they're all like graduated colors. Each pork is different, and I think that has to do with diet. So we use the birch bark from the white birch tree and sweetgrass. 
The sweet grass is a trim that goes around the boxes to help hold it as a binder. And then the quills is a decorative part that we put on the quill boxes. And the boxes are sewn together, you know, different sizes, different diameters. And many of the old museum pieces we see have boxes that need repair because the boxes warp and change with changes in temperature and with age. The older they are, the darker the bark gets because they didn't wash them. But these, since these boxes would warp and bend and change, then my teacher, Susan, taught me how to cut all the pieces out of the same thickness of bark so that then there wouldn't be the warping and changing going on further on, you know, as the box got older. It would be symmetrical. Yes. And the original boxes were used for storing seeds, herbs, medicines, dried foods, dried meats, dried berries, whatever, you know. And since we didn't have a written language, Whatever was inside the box, the picture was put on top. So the grandma might say, go dig in a cash pit, you know, and bring me some choke cherries and grapes and, and some dried meat. So the kid would go down there and look at the tops, find what he's looking for, and then bring it to the grandma, and she'd take a handful out and throw it in the soup pot and then give it back to him, and it would go back down into the cash pit again. The boxes are made tight so that bugs couldn't crawl up and inside the box. It would have to be really tight. Yeah. yeah, and they were put in the ground, lined with birch bark sheets and wooden stakes, you know, to hold them, to keep them upright. And then the floor was birch bark, and it would be bent down at the bottom so that, you know, animals and critters couldn't get in there. And then the cash pit lid was um, pretty heavy, too, so that animals, if they did smell the food and get in, want to get into it, you know, they would have a hard time lifting up the lid. Did it keep food cool? It kept it cool, kept it dry. And then so they would have a cash pit at the winter camp, and there would be one at the spring camp. So when they migrated inland to get away from the winter winds from the lake, when they got to where they were going, to the inland camp, winter camp, they called it, when they got there, then they would just uncover cash pit thing and bring out the foods that they needed mm -hmm. and then they would spend the winter there and trap and fish inland away from the winds and then they would replenish before they left you know they would also dried foods and put it back on the ground again and then migrate back to the lakeside you know in the spring when the fish started running so um, both camps would have that winter and spring camp would have that so the quill boxes were very important for food storage and they were usually stackable you know, and enough so that you could see what you needed in there. Tell me about your background in growing up and which Native American nation are you a part of? I'm an Odawa from, uh, we call it uh, Waganuxing, place of the Crooked Tree, Emmett County, Michigan. But I was born in Charlevoix, which is neighboring Emmett. Spent uh, eight years in a Catholic boarding school. Are those the notorious boarding schools? Yes. Yeah. How, what happened? They just came in took you? They took us, yeah. My father was raising us. He was court-ordered to release us to the school, and so he did. He didn't want to, but he did, because he was raising us on his own. So we were there, all of us, almost eight years, and then um, when we got out of there, I was so highly disciplined and monitored or, you know, had no say in what was going to happen to me that when I went to high school in ninth grade, I was a fish out of water. Those were the four loneliest years of my life because I had no friends. And it was because I was so highly disciplined that I didn't know how to socialize with kids my own age. I was just totally out of it. And they thought I was stuck up, not realizing that I was also terribly shy. Right. That happens a lot. You said you had been living with your father. Did you go back with your father? We did during the summer. We went to school, the boarding school, from September till May. We were at home for 90 days. And then... We were go back to school and went through that cycle. And you weren't allowed to speak your native tongue? No, no, we weren't allowed to speak at all. They let us speak at holidays like Christmas and Easter. We were allowed to speak at the table with each other. There were six at a table and 200 kids in a room. It averaged around 100 boys, 100 girls. All the girls was in one dorm. There were seniors, which was like fifth grade on up to eight, and juniors were fourth grade on down. So every senior had to take care of a junior. At the age of 10, we were working in the bakeries, baking 96 loaves of bread every other day, and uh, working in the kitchens and cleaning the school and you know, all the chores that, that a household would have to do. So 
that's where we learned that. And then when we got out of the school then, we stuck to the same discipline when we got home. Did your father have a more traditional Native American life? My father was a, uh, a son of a Methodist circuit rider. He was very respectful of us girls while we were growing up. There was uh, four girls and one boy. I remember getting one spanking from him during my lifetime. It had quite an impact on me because when we went to the boarding school, they had capital punishment. So I got beat up a lot in school. By the nuns? By the nuns, yeah. Mainly because to look at them in the eye was defiance. I didn't actually look them in the eye. I looked at the pin on top of their forehead in their habit. You know, I would look at that so that to them it was defiance. And so they would always signal me out because I was taller. And I was kind of a little bit of a leader and didn't realize it because I was taller. The kids kind of gravitated towards protection. Where was your mother? She left when I think I was about six, five or six years old. We came home from school and uh, she wasn't around. So we decided, well, we'll start cooking. It's a good thing my dad came home. We could have burnt the house down. So anyway, my dad came home and he found a note on his pillow and he, he read it and then he came out and he had it in his hand and he said, your mom's not going to live here anymore. So we said, okay. <laughs> and then from then on, he started taking care of us. Would you see your mother? I didn't see her again till I was 17 or 18 years old when she came home. My sister told her, what are you here for? You know, we don't need you. We needed you when we were four and five years old. So, you know, she says, and dad did a good job raising us and, and we don't need you. So my mother left again and went to Traverse City. She did come back when she turned 65 and I took her in and helped her get settled in and helped her find an apartment. By then she became a Jehovah Witness. The church pretty much helped her get back on her feet. Was, th was it through your mother's family that there was this strong tradition of quill working, or was it through your father? On my father's side. It was your father's side? Yeah. Aha, okay. My yeah. father had some aunts who were quill workers, Anna O'Day Men. She was uh, one of the finer quill workers up in uh, Cross Village, which is where our family came out of. Well, let's go back to that first box. So you pulled all the quills out of mm -hmm. the porcupine, and Susan was satisfied. Mm -hmm. And what happens then? We put them in a dish pan and we washed them. She used a detergent soap and would wash them. And they were rinsed two or three times. And then uh, spread out on newspapers to dry. And then from there they went into boxes. And then they were kept in these boxes until we were ready to use them. So when I'm ready to make a quill box, then I would go get all the washed quills and bring them out. And then, then I would sort different sizes what I was going to use. There's, there's probably three major sizes. So it would be the small size, which was used for design. The background quills, which is a little longer quill that was used for background around, say, the choke cherries. Then there was a, a heavier quill, which went around the edges of the quill box, uh, the sides. And then the fourth size was a larger one, which went around the bottom of the quilled box so that it was quilled on top, around the sides, and totally around the bottom. Pardon my ignorance, but it would seem that the quills would be very tough and not pliable. When they're dry, they are. If you bend a quill when it's dry, you know, it develops a weak spot, you know, and when you soak it in water to make it soft, which is what we do. Is that what you do after you take the washed warm, quilts? Yeah, after they're dried and we sort out all the sizes we need, warm water gets poured onto the quills and then they soak a little bit and within five minutes they're ready to use. So once it's softened up in the warm water, you can uh, flatten them, bend them, twist them, braid them, tie knots in them, do pretty much what you want with it as long as the quill is wet. As soon as it dries, it, be it becomes brittle and it keeps its shape. As you said, traditionally, the quills are added as decoration to the box, but also as information that would reveal the contents of the box. What are some of the traditional designs? It would be a, like a cross quill. The choke cherry design berries might be on the top of the lid, and then to cover the seams where they come together at right angles, the, the round lid and the walls of the side, when they come together, those quills are put in there in X's just to cover the corner seams to make it look nicer. And then the binding goes on, the inside lining, it all goes in, and then it's bound together with the uh, sweet grass and so the sweet grass is sewn in around the box and then we make the bottom to fit the top. Around the time you were learning how to make a quill box, 
were they still functional or were they being used more as as a decorative piece? Or both. The original ones were used for food storage. Right. When the Europeans came and saw them, they thought, well, this would be a nice box to give my wife to put her handkerchiefs in or her gloves. So they started asking for functional boxes that would fit their needs, the European needs. And so they started changing after that. When I learned how to do quill boxes, we were making pencil boxes. And we were making uh, boxes that were more for tourist or collector's items. People were, when I was learning, people were beginning to collect the boxes. So they became collector's items. And I heard my boss call them instant antiques because you made the box and when it sold, you know, you didn't know where it was going or anything. We weren't allowed to sign the boxes on the bottom because he was a middleman. He didn't want customers bypassing him and going directly to the artist. So that actually, we didn't start signing our boxes until probably 1980, 1982, something like that. When you're making a quill box, you have to think about the design that you're going for first. Mm -hmm. Do you sketch it out or you, you can visualize it and then translate that to the box? I sketch all of them out and I do that to keep track of what I've done. And it's given a number so that I know, you know what I did with that and who it even got sold to. There's a code number that goes with it as to who bought it. So I try to keep track of all the pieces that I made and sometimes we do take scan it or take photographs of it to keep track of what we've done. How long does it take to make a, I mean obviously it would depend on the size, but a, a medium sized quill box, how um, long would that take? A small one, like three inch diameter and two inches high, we figure one a week. So that's when I work from 10 o'clock till four and then seven at night till 11 that same night. So I put in a full day's time on it. And my son Arnold said, since we enjoyed doing quill work so much, he said, we shouldn't call it quill work. We should call it quill art because it's not work. It was therapeutic for both of us. Yes, your son is, he's a known yeah. quill artist. You began creating your own designs. I did. When I learned from Susan, she gave me stencils to trace around of squirrels, rabbits, stars, different things that I could make on a quill box top. And she allowed me to use her patterns. In fact, I traced them and have my own birch bark cutouts. And then when it's falling apart, and then we retrace it and make a new one. So she allowed me to use her patterns and, and designs. And then uh, since she was my teacher, I was allowed to do any of the designs that she did. It was just teacher to student. Mm -hmm. She had me doing a lot of geometrics, a lot of floral, the sugar cookie designs and things like that. But I wasn't satisfied with that. I wanted something a little more, I think dimensional was a word. She hadn't taught me how to do animals because uh, she just didn't do those. She stayed with her mother's patterns and designs and, and didn't expand. But what I did, one day I was sitting at home and got off of work and I was sitting there and I thinking, I gotta make a quill box, you know. So I started digging out my tools and the quills and everything and, uh, and I was sitting there and I said out loud, what am I gonna make? And this voice behind me says, why don't you try an animal? And it was my teacher's voice. And she had long gone, long gone, you know. So I made a, a bear, a charging bear. I made it and I was satisfied with it. So I finished it and took it to market. And the buyer looked at it and set it down and walked away. And then uh, I thought, what's the matter with it? Doesn't he like it? And so he said, how much you want? So I told him. And then he said, no, this is what we pay for that kind of a box. So he was pretty much controlling how much he was paying for different size boxes. And in doing that then, he set the standard for what he wanted to see in boxes. He set the standard for sizes, uh, dimensions, everything. What I found out later years was they actually kept my first bear. It's in their private collection. You know, they didn't even go out on the shelf. Give me another example of a design. Well, another box that I made was a spider web, and that was my teacher's and her husband's creation. It's called a spider web quill box. It's an oval box with X's on it and then little quill diamonds on it. And to this day, I haven't figured out which is a spider and which is the web, you know, but that's what she named it, was a spider web. So that was their contribution to the quill work art form. And once I learned how to do it, she allowed me then to continue making those boxes. 
And then my students, when I teach them, they also make the spider web quill box. But they also learn the history, you know, that this family started that design and continue on with it. Because designs belong to the families that create them. I don't mean exclusively, but there's that sense of this is where they come from. They belong to the teacher, and then whatever the teacher gives you, you can continue on with it. And in that way, it shows a genealogy of a quill box. Somebody might look at my student's quill work and say, that almost looks like Susie's. Well, sure, you know, because Susie's student taught them, right. so it shows a genealogy. And Susan did quill boxes like her mother, Marion, Kugama. So it shows a genealogy of a quill box. There are stories sometimes attached to quill boxes? Yeah, when I teach a class, I had a great aunt named Irene Walker, and she was one of those Native women who did everything she could do. Weaving, sewing, quilling, basket maker, storyteller. She was all of those things. And she was recorded telling the stories. And so I read the stories and, and retell them then to my students, how, we, how the porcupine got his quills. And we tell that when I'm teaching the class, the students get that along with the quill lesson. And then when we're doing the white birch tree, then we tell the story of how the birch tree got its, its uh, white bark. So there's different stories. The only thing we don't have is a story for sweet grass because sweet grass is a ceremonial grass. It's a um, spiritual gift. So there is no story that I know of that was made up to tell why we have the sweet grass other than in, it's a gift from the Creator. Same way with sage, tobacco, and cedar. You know, there are no stories made up about how they came to be. It's just that it is a gift. When did you start teaching? When I worked with Susan, my teacher, must have been in our fourth or fifth year, she would say, I'm the teacher. She said, when I'm gone, you're the teacher. Because she used to tell customers when they walked in the store some outrageous stories sometimes. Like red quirky pines are hard to come by, you know, and, and green ones are, are worse, you know. You can only get them in winter near Christmas or something like that. So she would tell crazy stories, you know, and, uh, and I would hear that and laugh, you know. But, and when I heard Susan telling outrageous stories, and I thought, well, we should have the truth along with the stories. Mm -hmm. So I, I began telling the truth about quill boxes. Well, you're very passionate not just about quill boxes, but you're also very passionate about teaching. Right. What I was learning from Susan was a very important thing. And the people would come in and look and say, oh, that looks so tedious, but it wasn't. It was relaxing to me, and I enjoyed it. I began teaching the day she died, I, and I didn't know she walked on, but the same day she walked on, two people came to my door and said, will you teach us how to do quill work? And I said, I never taught before. I said, but I'll give it a try. And they said, well, how much do you charge? And I said, $30 in food stamps a piece. What the food stamps did was fed them. They were from Detroit, and I was in Emmett County. So they stayed at my house, and all the food stamps did was feed them while they were taking the class. Mm -hmm. And I had a full-time job, too, so I worked with them at night from 7 till 11. But during the day, they had assignments to do. What I did was, one of the first quill boxes Susan had me make was a star, a six-point star. And she said it was a traditional design because it stands for the four directions and the sky and the earth, which is six points. So she had me doing that. And the plan for that star was to learn to place the quills side by side in an orderly fashion, straight, so that where you started from and ended on the point of a star, it was straight. And then you went to the next diamond of the star and filled that in too. So when I do a class, they have to learn and use the same star that I do. But so we have 15 different ways to do the same star. The shadings were all different. So the dimensions, you know, it changes. Some of the stars were dimensional, three-dimensional. It looked like it moved. Other stars didn't. You know, so it was forcing them to become creative with their work and learning how to use the shading, learning how to place the quill side by side in an orderly manner. So that was the goal of their first quill box. You became a full-time quill maker in the 19... 1980s. What precipitated that decision? And I mean, that's a very bold move. 
Yeah, I was on living on welfare, and I knew how to do the quill work, but I figured, well, if I want to make it and survive, you know, I'm just going to have to work a little harder, which is what I did. And I decided back then, you know, to become a full-time quill worker. And I made that statement verbally, you know, so that people would know that I'm really giving it a go at this. It was fun. In my good days, in my fastest days, you know, I was just cranking out, we call it cranking out one quill box every other day, something like that. Or even two quill boxes a week if we had to. But by then, my children were small, so I uh, worked longer. Instead of working from 7 till 11 as usual, I just upped it to 7 till 3 in the morning and worked. And I figured with that, I could pay my bills and raise the kids on my own and take care of them that way. When you began doing quill art, was there a danger of this not continuing on as a cultural practice? Because not that many people know about it, and now can you see that expanding? The future of quill work is expanding, but the resources are being depleted because of the the beetle that's killing the white birch tree. Um, Michigan State has been working for years trying to figure out how to eradicate that beetle, but it is still tearing up our natural trees. And the sweetgrass field where we pick our sweetgrass is marked off for sale as a place where somebody could build a home. And when that happens, then they stop the water flow and then the sweetgrass fields die off. And we did a few moves trying to buy that field, but haven't been able to, to do that because if we buy it and then protect it, then even our own people can't go in and pick it. So we're trying to figure out a way that we can do that. But what we are doing is transplanting picking the sweet grass and transporting it and placing it on private properties of tribal members. And that way we can spread the sweet grass so that it'll continue growing. Yvonne, thank you so much for giving me your time and congratulations once again. Thank you. That was 2014 National Heritage Fellow, basket maker and quill worker, Yvonne walker Kishik. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. To find out how art works in communities across the country, keep checking the Artworks blog, or follow us at NEA Arts on Twitter. For the National Endowment for the Arts, I'm Josephine Reed. Thanks for listening. Thank you.